Happy Sabbath, church. Ooh, this is a very hot mic. Look at that. Happy Sabbath, church. Thanks, Dave, in the back for doing that. Wow, everyone could hear me. Very good. We have a lot of announcements today. We have a lot of things happening at this church this month. We are very excited that God is moving uh, powerfully here as we have a number of things to share with you. So I'm going to try and go through it quickly. Uh, the first is next week. It's very, very important that you are here. A uh, doctor and pastor Bill Payne, not P-A-I-N, the pain that hurts. This is, this is, his last name is Payne, but this is a godly man. He has a lot of experience and training and education. This is what he got his doctorate in on how to have effective small groups and effective uh, Sabbath school teaching and also how to do discover Bible studies, which is sending Bible studies through correspondence. This man is all about sharing the word of God with people in as many ways as possible. And he's gonna come next week. He's gonna be here on Friday night, 7 p.m. What time is he gonna be here next Friday? 7 p.m. Mark your calendars. It will be a powerful, powerful evening. We're going to have a short vespers. And then the next day, Saturday, he will be here. All Sabbath schools are closed, except for the kids. The kids will be open, but all of our Sabbath schools are closed. We're just going to have him leading out of Sabbath school right here in the sanctuary. And then he will also preach for the divine service. And then he will be having a workshop in the afternoon. Two different workshops. So next week is a very, very big, big event. We baptize it through the conference. Other church leaders might be here. Sister Church Anaheim people might be here. So this is a big event. Please be here. Bring your notepad, take notes, and be ready to share camaraderie. Very, very big. Next week, Dr. Bill Payne will be here Friday and Saturday. Also next week, we can't just have him here speak and then be here in the afternoon. We need to eat. So next week is also potluck. So make sure that you bring a dish. Make sure you bring something for us to eat. And we love those home recipes. If you have that special dish that you love to make, or you haven't made something in a while, you know brother or sister so-and-so enjoys it, or your family enjoys it, just bring it. Next week is potluck. Make sure you bring it prepared. Bring it prepared, and we'll have it here in the kitchen, and we'll have potluck next week as well. Also, next week, Saturday night, we have a youth event. Our youth are going to be having um, a social at John's Incredible Pizza next Saturday night. We're meeting there at 6.50 p.m. 6.50 p.m. And we're going to have a lot, a lot of fun. You know what John's Incredible Pizza is? It's pizza, there's games, there's a lot of activities to do there, and this is for our youth. So make sure you share with them and just meet us there. And don't forget to bring uh, $10. Also, March 24th, we're having a youth social. This is a, a youth vespers, youth vespers social. We're going to start this uh, this month, and we're going to keep doing it um, every month, twice a month. This is for our youth, Friday night vespers, and it's going to start um, at 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock. We're going to have pizza for our youth. We're going to have some fellowships some games and just... A, a short Bible study, if, if that, but it's a time for them to just come and hang out and worship and just get together. And so that'll be March 24th. Please save it to your calendars. We're going to start doing this more frequently. Also, we have our health ministry cooking club, which has already been launched last week. Um, after last year's 2022, we're doing it every month now. And this month, it will be March 25th. March 25th at 3 p.m. Now, the next screen, um, as David's going to share, is a QR code. If you have your phones, go ahead and take a picture of that. It's a quick survey. Um, Tiffany and her group wants to find out um, a little more information on your wants, on your needs. So if you have a phone, go ahead and take a picture of that. If not, I believe we may have some in the back. If not, um, talk to me on your Connect cards. Go ahead and grab one. Write the information, your email or your phone number, and just put it in the offering plate uh, towards the end of the service. But that's for our monthly cooking club, and it's very, very good. We had a very good time um, last uh, month, and we know we're going to have a good time this coming month as well. Uh, March 12th, Anaheim SDA Church is having a hike. 
their ministry team, the, one of their groups, loves, loves hiking. They love to go out. They can go out, I think, multiple times even during the week. This ministry, they just love hiking together. So they created this ministry, and they're asking us to join them. They're, we're being invited. So I know there's some hikers here who love hiking. They're going to be going to Santiago Creek Trail um, on March 12th. So bring your water, your snacks, and your gear, and just come and hike in fellowship with uh, fellow believers. Also this Tuesday, um, every other week, we have our Zoom Young Adult Bible Study on Tuesday. It's at 7 p.m. for our young adults. If you want to uh, share this news and information, go ahead and share that. But this is very important for our young adults, and we have a very, very good time just talking about life and how to... Uh, be who God calls to be in discipleship. Also, we're on our Friday nights, we're on break, obviously, because this coming Friday we have Dr. Bill Payne. So, Friday night Bible study for this Friday is on pause. So, we hope everyone will join us here uh, for that presentation. And then, our usual announcements we have our Bible 101. Uh, we meet here inside the multi purpose room, and we just had an awesome discussion on um, the second angel's message. Very, very exciting. Um, we also have uh, Orangewood Academy. Open enrollment has already began for the fall. I believe they're opening it to everyone. They already closed or passed the open enrollment for the existing students. Uh, now they're opening it up to everyone. So go ahead and look at that. See our school. It's a, it's a great school, great teachers, great environment. So don't miss out if that's something that you are looking at. Go ahead and check them out now. Also, this is tomorrow. Um, Orangewood Academy is need of some painters. They are painting their new STEM room. They have a STEM room uh, for students with technology and other books and uses, and we want to beautify the room. So tomorrow, it's from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. If you have a brush, you know how to paint, and you have time tomorrow, meet us over there at Orangewood. I'll be there, and we're going to um, paint the room. It won't take long, but you know, a lot of pants make easy loads. So let's go ahead and paint that and be finished with that quickly. And then in tithes and offerings, we are collecting it at the end of service. And those connect cards, uh, with any information, go ahead and fill those out and turn them in at the end of service. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the privilege of worshiping you. God, there's so many places we could be, but we recognize, God, that it is you, the creator of all that exists, that we have life, and that we can have it abundantly as we follow you. I pray, Lord, that as we worship you today, that our gaze and eyes and hearts will be turned to you and you alone, and that, God, the things of earth will just grow strangely dim as we behold you and see your goodness and your grace. Bless us as we worship you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
muscle. Did you know that God gives us lots of muscles? You have muscles in your arms. Can you put your arms up? The muscles help you move your arms, right? And we have muscles in our legs. Can you move your legs? Mm -hmm. And we even have muscles in our neck. And muscles in our neck hold up our heavy head. Some heads are bigger than others. But well, most heads are about 10 pounds. So can you go back and forth with your head? Yeah, that's because the muscles help you do that. Well, one of the smallest muscles that God created us with is our tongue. Do you have a tongue? Can you speak it out? Let me see your tongue. Very good. We can talk with our tongue, right? Our tongue helps us eat food, and our tongue helps us to swallow, and our tongue helps us to form words, right? We're going to do a little experiment now. I'm going to give you a glove, and then I put that on your hand. And Jojo, here's a glove for you. Put it on your hand as best you can. Got it? We're going to do a little experiment. I didn't want you to do it without the glove because we're not sure where your hands were. So we're going to do it. We're going to try and touch your tongue and hold on to your tongue with your glove hand. Can you do that? Like that? Hold your tongue with your hand. Hold on to it. And I want you to say, good morning, happy Sabbath. Holding your tongue.
But Psalm 34:13, as Meadow read, says, "Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies." So that means God wants us to say kind words, right? Not mean words or evil words, but things that will help other people. Which reminds me of a storybook character, and Mr. Dave is going to find that picture for us. One of my favorite Disney movies is called. You see the picture up there? Bambi. Bambi is one of my favorite Disney movies. And it was the first movie that Dominic ever saw at, at two years old. And he sat through the whole thing without saying a word. And Bambi had a good friend. Can you see who Bambi's friend is? What's the rabbit's name? Um, Daddy, you didn't show him Bambi yet? <laughs> Try. <laughs> He's not ready yet. So Bambi, Bambi's good friend, is a rat, and his name is Thumper. Do you know why his mommy named him Thumper? Because he thumps, thumps his foot on the ground just like that. Thump, 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 thump. So his mommy named him Thumper. That's a cool name for a rabbit. And his mommy said to him, Thumper, I want you to remember something very important. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Do you think that was good advice from his mommy? Yeah. She didn't want him to say evil things. She didn't want him to say mean things. She wanted him to say kind things. So that's a good reminder for us. If we don't have anything nice to say, maybe we shouldn't say anything at all. Right? It's okay to be quiet sometimes. So how do we control our tongue? Who helps us to control our tongue? The bow. The bow. The bow? Well, it's similar to the bow. The small rudder is like the tongue, right? But who helps us to control the words in our mouth? Jesus. Jesus. Right, Jesus. Jesus helps us to control our tongue. And he tells us in the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verse 4, God has given me a well-trained tongue so that I may know how to encourage people with my words. He wakes me up early in the morning and opens my ears to listen to him so that I may follow his words. So God helps us to control our tongue. So when we wake up in the morning, we thank Jesus for the brand new day, right? And we ask him to help us have a good day and a safe day, and to help us follow him, and use a little muscle he gave us to do nice things, to say good words, kind words, right? <laughs> when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me children, or I will die. It wrong. Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? Then she said, Get ready to build Hop, my maidservant. Sleep with her so that she can bear children for me, and that through her I too can build a family. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Yes. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here with you this morning. And as we have lived this past week with the craziness of the economy and the weather and all the things that have happened, everything changing around us, dear Lord, I am so grateful. You are unchanging. And yet, dear Lord, you change things for us. You change those horrific battle wars and flooding into beautiful snow capped mountains. And you change the way too much snow on those mountains to water for us in summer when we need it. And you change the pain and suffering in our lives, dear Lord, by sending us an extra portion of your Holy Spirit. So we thank you for your changeless and ever loving love, dear Lord, bless us through the service this morning and help us to learn more of you. In that name, amen.
they give it to you, but do you remember it? I saw on social media this, this, I felt bad that it made me laugh. It was so sad. This man named Stephen Thomas was a programmer um, in San Francisco, but he's from Switzerland. And the company that he did software programming for paid him um, in 2011 um, in Bitcoin instead of cash. And they paid him in 7,002 Bitcoin. For those of you who don't know how much that's worth, that's a lot. <laughs> um, at the time, it was worth about $6,000. Um, today, $220 million. Now, when he received payments, he put it on this contraption um, called, um, let me see if I get this right, it's called an iron key. It looks like a flash drive, I wish I had it, but I didn't put it up. Uh, but he put it on a flash drive, it's called an iron key. Now, the unique thing about this thing called an iron key is it is password proof. Which means if you are given only 10 attempts to put in the password, into this flash drive that contains all of the Bitcoin information in it worth $220 million. But if you exceed the 10 attempt limits, that iron key flash drive deletes everything inside of it. And he forgot the password and he's down to two trials. He's down to two tries. This man put it out there, and it's all over social media, and people are saying, dude, wait. Just think, think, write things out. I mean, you've tried it eight times, were you trying, were you just going with it? But man, eight attempts, you got two left, and they interviewed him, and, and he basically said in short, I've already made peace with it. Now, I don't know if anyone in their right mind, he's probably saying that to make himself feel better, but I don't think you could ever make peace knowing you have $220 million and all it takes is a password that you put that you can't remember. $220 million is in your hands reach but it might as well be 100 miles away. How anxious do you feel about losing out on similar investments in your life? Man, you put all this work in to be this computer programmer, you, you meet this company and they give you this thing called Bitcoin, which in 2011 you didn't really even know it meant much, but all these years later you're like, where is that flash of, oh, here it is, oh. He wanted to protect it so much that no one can touch it, no one can take it, but now it's even protected from him. 10 tries, eight attempts, two left. What's going through your mind? What would go through your mind? If you had this little flash drive called an iron key and you could not access your own money. How anxious would you be? How angry would you be? How fearful would you be? What else is going through your mind? And it goes through the story that this man was trying to do anything, anything, attempt anything to get this information. What about you? What do you have right before you that just seems so out of reach? What are you willing to do at all costs? At all costs? to do this. This month we're starting a new series called Transformative Discipleship. This aspect of discipleship that I want to emphasize this month is talking about total transformation. Total discipleship that deals with the whole person. And that's what discipleship is. If we really look at it, it deals with the whole person. How many uh, in Earth's history do we, do we see that there's monks who separate themselves from the world and they just want to be them and God and no one else. And they're so spiritually connected, but they may not connect with other people in the world. Is that truly discipleship? Because when I read the scriptures, it tells us to go and make disciples, not just be a disciple. 
What about those aspects in your physical, physical life that you want to emphasize so well, you want to eat healthy and be healthy, but maybe things in your mind aren't right? What about your social life? You just become a believer, and, and, you, and you leave certain circles of people who might not have been healthy for your spiritual life, but you never connected to godly people and godly relationships. They put those in your inner circle. See, it's one thing to leave something, but are we being connected? Right? All these things that deal with discipleship deal with the entire person. We may know scripture inside and out, but guess who else knows scripture inside and out? Satan. So just knowing the scriptures, learning all this is not enough, church. We want to be disciples of Jesus in all areas of our life. Transformative disciples in our spiritual life, in our physical life, in our social life. And there's this really hot topic going around now. It's huge. It's called emotionally healthy spirituality. I'm not sure if you've heard it. But it's huge. And it's talking about are we emotionally healthy people? Do we know God? Do we serve his purpose? Are we involved in church? But do we actually love people? Do we genuinely care about people? That's discipleship too. We can't ignore that. What about the human experience? Does God call us to be transformative discipleship? So today we're going to be discussing the wife of Jacob, who is Rachel, who is following God, serving his community, doing so much to just be involved in who God's called her to be, but had something that consumed her, that took everything else out of context. Nothing else mattered but this one thing, because she wanted it so badly. How many of us are frantically searching after things in life? It blinds us from all other things that God has for us, all of the things that God wants for us, all of the blessings that God has, but we can't take our eyes off that one thing. God, I have this iron key flash drive. It's in my hand, but I can't access it. It's driving Stephen mad. $220 million, and I can lose it like that with two more passes. What are you striving for in this current culture rather than the cross of Christ? What are you striving for that has you so captivated? The inner longings of our heart can't be satisfied by the cultural standards of society. Nothing in this world, nothing the world says is important. Nothing that people say that you need in your life, nothing that you might even think that you need in your life is that important because wholeness, discipleship, comes only when we seek God with our whole lives. Our whole lives. Not just our physical life. I gotta eat healthy. No, we're Adventists. We gotta eat healthy food. We gotta eat right. Oh, I gotta know the truth. I gotta know the three angels' message. Well, we gotta serve. We gotta serve. But emotionally, how are we? Man, this woman's obsessed. Because of one thing that's not there in her life. What are you striving for? Are we really seeking God in total disciples? in all areas of our life, and who he's called us to be. Before we go further, let's open up with a word of prayer. Let's pray. God of heaven, God of our fathers and our mothers, God of existence, Jesus, we are here today to ask that you would speak to us in those areas that, Lord, we need a little help. God, we are followers of you, we trust you, we worship you. God, in many ways, we give our lives to you. But even still, Lord, like Rachel, we are striving for something that, God, you need to bring to our focus. And so I ask as we go through this message that you would just speak to us and that we would follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1 through 3, as Elder Vicky read, says this. 
When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister, and she said to Jacob, Give me children, or I will die. I think that was more than just a verbal cry, don't you think? My sermon title is entitled The Inner Cry. Do we have inner cries? Do we have cries that we just long for that one thing for God? Like, God, if you only knew how much I wanted this, how much I needed this, how much I feel the pressure of this, God, I need this in my life, please. She's sharing this to her husband, Jacob. Give me a child or I will die. Jacob, well, reasonable response possibly, maybe not. Jacob became what? Angry. Why? Because he says, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Then she said, here's my maid Bilhah. Go into her that she may bear upon my knees and that I too may have children through her. What are we striving for, church? See, the cultural problem, I want to address some of the issues here. We see that the problem here that we realize the first thing is that without children, a woman was a waste. That's how some people view it. Man, you don't have children, what's wrong with you? Do we not see that even in today's day and age? You see a young couple, they got married, say, hey, uh, so when? 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 Grandparents, some of you are putting your heads down, you're like, yeah, we do that, we ask our kids. Right? <laughs> Right? We ask that question, right? In this case, even more so, hey, if woman, if you do not have children, there's something wrong. This is your purpose. So much so that even the Canaanites and the surrounding nations, the other cultures, would offer sacrifices. They would even offer the first children to ask their gods to give them other children. We have one child, we want many, so we're going to give you this one. Please give us even more. This is what the surrounding nations at the culture would do. And God had something to say about that. God was angry with his people because even God's people would sometimes participate in this because the world around them, the society dictated the, the, the cultural standard. And so when the people of Israel wouldn't get children, sometimes people would give in to that and they would offer that child in prayers, in hopes. To receive more. Can you imagine? At what cost? At what cost? This is God speaking through Jeremiah. He says this to the people of Israel. They built in high places of Baal in the valley in the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech. Though I did not command them, nor did it enter my mind that they should do this abomination. Causing Judah to sin. Children were expendable because you could always have more. You could always, let's just grab another wife. Let's just grab another servant. Why? Because we want more children for more power. See, before the day and age we lived in the currency exchange, they had a bartering system. And they would just exchange goods and land and property. And who do you think built that? The children. They get older. You want a big family because that means more land, more power. That's what life was about. And I dare say it's no different today. We just don't use barter, we use currency now. It's all about power. Have children. Woman, this is your job. Hurry up and have more children. And they felt that. And they carried that. And they allowed it to get into them. Like, if I don't have this, I'm a waste. Of a woman. No one wants to feel like they're a waste. So she turns to her husband and she says, You better do this or I'm going to die. And his response This is not in my control. There is nothing I can do. God has withheld your, from you from the fruit of the womb for some reason. I don't know. But this is not. I doing? This is the problem of the culture. Without children, a woman was a waste. 
Second problem, they wanted to preserve fertility at all costs. Preserve fertility. I want, you to, I want to read this for you. This is the wedding. The, the, the Israelites, the, the, the Jews, the Hebrews, they got married under this thing called the chupa. And you probably see that even today when you see weddings. They have this ark over them. You see the pastor, the rabbi, the priest, and you see the couple there. This chupa was actually found in the Old Testament as if to symbolize God. This is the presence of God, as if God is marrying them, as God's blessing. It's what God has bound together, let no one have sacrifice. It's the presence of God. It's what you know. And so when they're having this wedding, they cover Leah completely. They covered her, and Jacob married Leah, which is not the woman he wanted, by the way. We're going to go into that later, but I'm trying to just emphasize this point. She was the older sister. Rachel was the younger sister. And so Laban deceived Jacob. And he dressed up his eldest daughter, covered her in the veil, which was unnatural. You can't even see it. And they went to the seminary ceremony. They went under the chupa. And they went inside the tent, which was right there. And everyone's kind of outside, which is very awkward. But it's the culture, so I guess it's accepted. That feels very awkward. But then they go, and it's dark. And according to Jewish sources, you would think, how could Jacob not realize that that's another woman and not the one that he wanted? Well, Jewish sources are sharing that Rachel was actually in the room, too. In fact, she was probably under the bed and she was speaking when Jacob would talk to her. Is there so much Jewish traditions that are sharing? I don't know how that gets around your head, but apparently that's what they say. But apparently, Jacob did not know that this was Leah until the morning. In the morning, he looked beside him, and he was in horror. This is not the woman I was supposed to marry. And he went over to Laban, and he said to the father, what have you done to me? What have you done? What have you done? It's very interesting, because if you look at this, look, notice what's going on here. In Genesis 29, it says this. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is it that you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said the cultural lie. Listen to the cultural expectation. This is not done in our country. Giving you the younger before the firstborn. There's only so much time she has. I had to give you my oldest. Because she only has so much time. Fertility is important. I cannot give you my younger and give up my older. You have to marry her. For the culture, for the sacrifice of fertility, I deceived you. Is this what we do in church? For the, for the idol, for the worship of fertility, Laban did this. You know, growing up, I'm the middle child, and we had a three-bedroom uh, house. And when my older brother and I are about a year, 16 months apart, my little brother is six years younger. So when Jake Jojo, sorry, whoa, I'm talking about my kids. My younger brother Samuel was first born, he had his own room. He was the baby, he was in the crib. But as he got older, and now we're all around the same age or older, then the older brother got his own room, because he's the oldest. So I went from going with the older brother to then going with the younger brother. And then when I went to college, you have dorms. You don't have your own room. So then I shared with others. It wasn't until my junior year in college, no, my fourth year, sorry, my fourth year in college, senior, where I wanted to leave the group of dorms and I had my own room, and I rented a room in someone's house, so I still wasn't alone. But I rented my own room, and I remember that first night, by myself, in my own room, I was almost, what, 19, 20, 20 years old, finally my own space, I was so excited. Little small room, but it was mine. I could do whatever I wanted. And I was lying there at night, and man, it's like, this is my area. It's so quiet. No one's snoring or no one's talking to me or no one's like asking me for help on their homework because 
People would ask in college, like, hey, man, I can't go to sleep with, the room, with, the, with, the, with their desk and I'm trying to sleep. Hey, turn the light off. This is the first time. Middle child, I got my own room. It was strange. So you realize, church, cultures, no matter what things, there's transitions, there's changes. There's the oldest gets this, the youngest gets this. In the middle, you're kind of like, in both. This is not just a thing in the past, it's culture. There's things that the oldest gets. There's things that the youngest gets. The nice thing about the middle is we get the best of both worlds. <laughs> but these are just things. We've all been part of it. If you have siblings, you have parents, you know you've got a taste of simply by birth order. Things happen the way they do. Just because that's the way it is. But here it got to a point where it was just so bad and so toxic that it became an idol. It became an idol. She is my oldest. It is not custom for you to have my youngest. I'm sorry, Jacob. This is the cultural standard. And I'm going to abide by it. Fertility was prized at all costs. At all costs. The third thing is happiness is not a personal responsibility. That's the problem. Like, oh, my happiness is based on somebody else. Do we still do that today? Do we still hold other people for our happiness? Notice what it says, Jacob, it's your job. Your job. Why, I'm not pregnant. It's your fault. <coughs> Can you imagine this now? Working seven years, seven years of his life for her, then being deceived, and then working another seven. Fourteen years for one woman, and she has the audacity to say it's your fault. Can you imagine, Jacob, what else can I do? Fourteen years of my life just to get the opportunity to love you. Have I not proven enough? What else can I show that I will not do anything for you? But it wasn't enough. Jacob, do this or I will die. And Rachel had a solution. Rachel had a solution. Notice her solution is not different than those who have gone before. Notice this. We see this in Genesis 30 verse 4 as we read this. Elder Ricky read this. So she, Rachel, gave him her maid, Bilhah, as wife, and Jacob went into her, and Bilhah conceived, and bore Jacob a son. Where else do we see this? Well, we see this in Sarah, Abraham, the grandparents. Very same thing. The very same thing. It says this. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar, and Sarah said to Abraham, you see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go into my slave girl, that it may be not I, that, that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. You see that same thing. Now obviously this is not something that God condones. God doesn't say, hey, this is a great idea. You see all the strife that comes and we're going to get into that. Can you imagine? They're just like, I want children so bad I'm willing to make more hardship. And it's all for this thing of make me happy. You make me happy. You make me happy. Do we not see that even today? These are the cultural things we see today. Church, what are you striving for in this current culture rather than the cross of Christ? The inner longings of our heart can't be satisfied by the cultural standards of society. Because wholeness, discipleship, full transparent discipleship, transformative discipleship, wholeness in following God can only be found when we seek God with our entirety. All of it. Our mental, our social, our, our, our spiritual, every aspect. Rachel was doing the faithful thing. She was being a good wife. She was probably following the Lord in all these areas. But this one thing she was striving for so badly, it consumed her above all else. 
When you look at discipleship, we have to realize there's some things that are in the Bible that tell us what to do, but also what not to do. Rachel was so fixated on this, she was willing to do it at any cost. And Timothy even endorses and tells us, hey, husbands, have one wife. God doesn't endorse polygamy. You see this throughout Scripture, and when we see it, we see the ugly effects. There's strife, there's bitterness, there's kings and kingdoms and kids wanting to kill each other for the kingdom, and there's just death. What do we, what do we, Rachel, you, and me, need to be reminded of to experience wholeness of Jesus in our lives? What do we need to be reminded of? God, we need wholeness in our lives. Rachel, in tears, I'm worth nothing. That's what the world and society tells me. I'm worth nothing. I don't like feeling this way, Jacob. Do something about it. In tears, she's weeping. I'm worth this. What does Rachel need to be reminded of to experience wholeness in Christ? What do you need today to be reminded to experience wholeness in Christ? We have a lot of things right, but there's some things that we need still to give to God. What are you striving for? First thing I'd like to share is don't obsess over, but seek all of God's blessings. Don't obsess over them. She was so obsessed. This is a blessing from God. Children are a gift from God. Look at these scriptures. It says here, Proverbs 18, 22. He who finds... He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Proverbs 18, find a good wife. This is a good thing. Genesis 1, 28 says, God bless them and says to them, be fruitful and multiply. Yes, this is a command from God. It's a beautiful thing. Fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the birds, over the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. All these things are good things. Seek them out. Don't obsess over them. Don't obsess over them. That's the problem. We obsess yeah. over good things. God, I want, I, I, I want this though. If you don't give it to me, I'm just going to die. Are you? Are you going to jeopardize your relationship to God for that? For the IMP flash drive in your hand? You're going to curse God and die if you don't get that? Does God want us to have good things? Yes. Does God want us to have children? Well, He actually gave the command. Yeah, absolutely. But if it doesn't happen, are we going to be self destruct Are we going to curse God and die? Don't obsess, but seek for God's blessings. Seek for them. Where are you seeking? I saw this man at Starbucks. Um, a couple, couple days ago, I dropped off my kids. I didn't have a chance to eat breakfast. You know, parents are just rushing in the morning. Like, I gotta feed them, feed this, get this. They didn't wake up on time. It's getting late. You know what? I'm gonna skip breakfast. Drop them off. I'm like, I am hungry. So I drove over to Starbucks. I was gonna grab something. And I'm waiting in line. There's tons of people there in the morning, by the way. I didn't know there was a rush. Like, like it's not like, like a couple. It's packed. The line went outside. And I'm like, this is not worth it. And all of a sudden, a group just left. And I'm like, oh, okay, gosh, sure. So I stayed in line. There's this older man in front of me, this gentleman. And he was just in such a good mood. He's laughing, he's joking. I'm like, whoa, like, why is he here getting food? He seems like he's great. I'm sitting here hungry. And I get angry, so be careful. When I'm hungry, don't talk to Pastor. Me. But I'm sitting there, and, and he just looks at me. He's like, hey! And I'm like, it's not a good sign. Like, Lord, I want to be a witness at all places. I'm like, this is, this is a tough one, right? Here. So I'm just quiet, right? So you can't say anything nice, right? <laughs> Hear quickly, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to write, right? Slow to write, slow to write. So I'm sitting here, and he starts talking to me, and I'm like, okay, talk. I start talking to him, sharing. And then he asks me, what do you do? And I'm like, I have to be careful about what I share this. Because some people get really turned off when, when they hear pastor. And I just told him, like, oh, I'll just tell him, and then he'll stop talking to me. And I'm like, I'm a pastor. Oh, really? I was like, oh. keeps going. 
So he gets to the register and he orders, he looks at me, he's like, what do you want? And I'm like, oh, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. He's like, no, what do you want? And I'm like, okay, well, I was just gonna get the possible patty, um, little bagel thing. He's like, okay, and then he buys it. And I'm like, oh, so nice. And now I, I, I've drastically changed, right? <laughs> So then we go and we sit down waiting for our boarding and just to share. He talks about his grandkids, his three kids, two sons and a daughter. And he goes to a church, I forgot which one over here, and it's just so joyful and laughing, just start talking. He says, so you're a pastor, which church? I tell him, he's like, I might go with you, we'll see. And he, we just start talking, he says, wow, he's like, this, this thing's just bothering me. He said, you know, I raised my kids a certain way, but my daughter's just kind of falling off. She's just out there and she's given, given up on her daughter. I'm raising her daughter. I'm raising my granddaughter. And I'm like, praise God, you're there. He just kept on sharing. He started sharing about how she's just gone and left. And he's striving just to do whatever he can for his daughter and his granddaughter. And, and, and the Lord just spoke to me. I'm like, you know what, brother? I need to share with you. You know, everything that you're doing is going to make a difference. Uh, Proverbs tells us. Train up a child the way he should go. And when he is old, they will not depart. Doesn't say they won't leave the church. They won't leave. But the seeds that are planted, they're going to stay. Amen. Just like the prodigal son, when he was gone, it says he came to himself. He came back. And I'm like, what you're doing is going to stay. That's God's promise. That's God's promise. And he's like, I'm obsessing over a lot of things around him. Yeah, we all do. Mm -hmm. We had a prayer and that was it. But some of us are striving, man, I want this so badly. I want it so badly. We're striving. You just give it to God. Yeah. What does God ask you to do? We're striving so much. Let God do it. Let God do it. Just let Him do it. You be the disciple. Mm -hmm. You be the messenger. You be the model. Let God do the transformative discipleship. It's a beautiful truth, church. It's a beautiful truth to seek the kingdom above every every other pursuit. Seek God's kingdom. Allow Him to build it. The third thing I have to share is seek a deeper identity in Christ. Seek a deeper identity in Christ. Man, can you imagine? Just hearing this, if you're on the receiving end, give me a child or I will die. Can you, can you, can you let those words just sink in hearing that from someone who's that close to you? What are you willing to do? To do? You're willing to do anything. You're willing to say, I'll do another seven years. 21 years, right? Jacob's like, I need you seven, 14, let's do 21. If I can do it, I would. I would. But there's something else, church. We need to seek a deeper identity in Christ. Notice what this passage says in Romans. Sorry, we're all the way through three. Sorry, I'm not clicking this thing. Seek a deeper identity in Christ. Romans chapter 7 tells us this, verse 8 to 10. But sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from, this, from the law, sin lies dead. I once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came in, sin revived, and I died. And the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. What is this telling us? We go around life wanting everything. I want this. I want that. Look at the world around me. They have this. At this time, everyone's having children. If I don't have children, I'm going to die. And God is saying, we want everything so much. But the moment we seek a deeper relationship with God, the moment we see the sin that the law puts in front of us, we see we are very covetous people. When we start seeking a close relationship with God, we start seeing, I want too much stuff that I probably don't think I really need. Because when the law comes in, we realize our covetousness. We realize all the sin, and we say, God, remove the sin. Remove the sin. Remove the sin. So I could have a deeper walk with you. Growing up in, in the Spanish church, there, there was a woman, she couldn't have children. And she adopted the kids of the church. 
and she would be with us all the time. She became the youth Sabbath school teacher, the young adult Sabbath, at that time we put them all together, and we were just with her, and then she would, and this was before text messaging, so she would actually write us letters. And she asked permission of all the moms before she did it, but she would write us letters, and at the very end, she would say, love you to pieces, all my heart, your mom. And she would write letters to every single youth, every single young adult, because she made every single child her child. She wanted children so bad. She's like, these are my kids. These are my kids. Up until a couple of years ago, I was still getting mail. She says, you, you keep moving. You keep moving. I'm like, oh, pastor, I went to seminary, came back, went to this church, this house. She's like, you keep moving. It's not moving. <laughs> mom, sorry, mom. I call her mom. Since like junior high or high school. Because she wanted a deeper identity in Christ. She said, I want to understand. Number four, seek godliness before goodness. Seek godliness before goodness. First Timothy 1, 6 to 7 says this, Of course there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. I'm not saying don't seek good things, but as you seek godliness, be content. I love this thing. Some of you may not like the reference, but there's a gentleman who gave a poo by saying, When you are in a hearse, there's no you all behind it. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard that? There's no you all behind a curse. Famous man, Denzel Washington said that. He says, You'll never see you all behind a curse. Now, I have been blessed to make hundreds of millions of dollars in my life. I can't take it with me, and neither can you. It's not how much you have, but what you do with what you have. See, when we realize the stuff in the world that keeps putting pressure on us to think that we should have or we should be, we need to be reminded to draw closer to Christ. Draw closer to Christ. Draw closer to Christ. Seek godliness before the goodness and the stuff. Always seek godliness before everything. I'd like to close with the story. We know the story of Jacob and Laban, where Jacob has now amassed so much land, so much property, he has these children, he has this land, and he starts to go, and Laban is worried. Laban says, I can't let you leave. These are my children. This, these are my daughters. These are my cattle. This is my land. Everything is mine. This is mine. You can't leave. And Jacob says, I have to leave. And notice what Laban says, speaking of contentment. Notice what he says. He says these words. It says, Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, that These daughters are my daughters. The children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do today about these daughters of mine, or about the children whom they are born? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. If you ill-treat my daughters, or if you take even more wives in addition to my daughters, though no one else is with us, remember that God is witness between you and me. What is Laban saying? I know the strike that's going to come if you try and follow the culture around you. You have enough children, you have these wives, you take on more, you're going to cause even more strife. Don't do that to the daughters. Don't do that to my daughters. And if I'm not here, promise me. Promise me you're not going to be chasing. Though he created the problem already. He's asking, please don't keep on going in that direction. Stop striving. After the things of this world, stop striving after these other things. Be content with what God's giving you. Church, I'm not saying don't see God's goodness, don't see God's blessings, just don't obsess over them. Don't let them control you and take you away to lead you to places that's not transformative discipleship. What are you striving for? For the cause of Christ? Or what are you striving for in this culture rather than the cause of the inner longings of the heart can't be satisfied by the cultural standards of society because true wholeness in your life can only be found when we seek Jesus with our entire being. With our entire being. Not just knowing the scriptures. Not just eating right. Not just serving here and there. 
Not just checking your heart and your inner circumstances, but your entirety. All of it. God, I want all of it. All of you in my life. Church, what is your inner cry? And have you given it to the Lord? Amen. Mm -hmm. They've been here a couple decades, I think. 
So we want to send them off. Please be here um, that final Sabbath of this month, March 25th, and share your love with them. Share your love with them. But um, so if you already know, but now we're just announcing to the church, make it official and save that date. We're going to be having a fellowship lunch for Dave and Linda, March 25th. Let us stand for prayer. Dear Lord, we are amazed by how you love us and freely give us so much good things in our life. God, as we go through this month, as we discuss transformative discipleship, I pray, God, that we would also be reminded today that, God, you give good things, but let us not be obsessed with them. Let us not let the world dictate what we think is important. But may all things be judged by your view, your ways, your book, your, your guidance, your teachings. Because in them is life. And Lord, that's what we want. We want you. I pray, Lord, as we leave this place, that you not have only spoken to us, but you have also freed us. Freed us from the chains and the cares that the world has placed on us. And we say today, Lord, we will not let those things dictate our life. God, we pray that you would lead us even in those areas today. Bless us now as we leave this church, but not from your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a Sabbath, church.